I just did a 50 day challenge live on YouTube. I closed 125 contracts in 50 days. We don't manufacture deals, we find deals. And if you're sitting there and you're trying to manufacture that deal, then it's probably gonna be a mistake. The hard part becomes dispo. How the heck do you manage closing just deals everywhere? You have to get good at asking questions to get them to What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, I've got the man known as the King Closer. This guy wins every single event. And he's also told me that he takes credit for actually discovering me as a person before I ever, uh, <laughs> you know, started doing social media. But I actually brought him in because, you know, now in um, my house living business, we are doing nationwide wholesaling. And this guy, you know, he's one of the best, if not the best in the entire country at closing deals nationwide over the phone in one call. I was like, bro, you just got to come and let's film a podcast. Let's talk about it. But also, I just selfishly really want you to train my team. <laughs> you know, one thing you you talk about a lot, and that's what's got you those belts, is like this one call close. Yep. Like, what exactly is that? So one of the things that I've kind of differentiated myself from almost everyone in the industry is reversing the the closing process where almost everyone wants to verify that they want to sell, talk about condition, talk about timeline, build rapport, and then talk about the numbers and the price and go in for the close. Um, I'm very polar opposite of that. It's, hey, do you want to sell? How much are you looking to get for the property? Then I open up with open-ended questions. I don't go into specifics about condition. I don't go into specifics about the timeline. It's just tell me a little bit about what you got going on allow the seller to tell me what's most important from them and then really kind of use my ability to carry conversation through open-ended questions, kind of pull out what's most important to the seller and then see if I can match their asking price. So a lot of times we're not even giving an offer. Actually, that was one of the big things with your team today was, is removing the word offer from the vocabulary. Mm. Um, we don't want to say that. We want to see if we can give the seller what they want. This eliminates the seller remorse, sellers wanting to back out of contracts, um, really kind of putting ourselves in the best position possible to close the deal um, because they're happy with it. And it's a win for us. It's a win for the seller and it's a win for the end buyer as well. So what would you say from a sales perspective that when you just go and accept an offer, you know, a seller instantly thinks, oh crap, I could have got more. So one of the things that we do there is what we call reverse rapport. And I'm glad you brought that up because this was a big kind of light bulb moment for your team this morning was, so we're just giving the seller what they want. And it's about building credibility and then kind of giving them the understanding that we're making this a win-win across the board and explaining how we're the experts in the situation. And when they kind of realize that when we build the rapport through the credibility and how we're solving their problem, and we really dive into understanding what their pain and motivation is, the example that I gave today was, is there's a gentleman with an amputated leg that his bathroom no longer had floors and he needed to sell his property because with the amputated leg and the floor missing in the bathroom, I mean, he was in a pretty bad spot. Yeah. And through the reverse rapport with me talking to him about how we were going to solve his problem, understanding how he was going to get moved, understanding how, how he was going to receive the funds. It's crazy how many people don't know how a real estate transaction actually takes place. Yeah. We do it all day, every day. This might be one to three times in their life. They ever do a real estate transaction. So really breaking down that credibility kind of eliminates that like, I think I could have gotten more because we're not just diving into saying, okay, yep, I can give you a hundred thousand for your house. It's yeah. about solving their problem and that credibility side of things. Yeah. I just kind of wonder like, um, to like reframing it of, you know, let's just say I'm going to accept their offer. Right. You're like, Hey, what do you want? And they say, Oh, I want, you know, 70 K hundred K whatever. Right. And you know, you're not just like, yeah, okay, let's do the deal. Right. You're right. like, Okay. You know, and you just kind of go into whatever you say, right? But now I'm saying, tell me a little bit about what you got going on. Exactly. Now you're going to tell me the most important thing to you. 
Yeah. And now I have to find more out about that than what you just told me. Mm -hmm. You're going to tell me four minutes of information. I need to get 10 minutes of information out of you. That's where the skill set for the closer has to come in. You have to get good at asking questions to get them to tell you more than they originally tell you. Yeah. If you can do that, then you're going to crush it. That's why I told you your team's going to crush it because they, I saw their ability to continue conversations today Mm -hmm. that a lot of people lack the ability to do that. That's good. So you're going to, you know, have this conversation with them for 10 minutes. Well, you're not even having a conversation. They're just telling you about stuff. Right. And so basically you're like, all right, so what do you want for it? They say a hundred thousand. And is your response from there just simply like, well, you know, we're not, you're not paying any closing costs. You're not paying any realtor fees. We cover all that. You know, it's a net offer to you. So like, is that the best you can do? And I asked them, what's the best you can do for me? What's the best you can do for me? So it's that wording every time. Yes. So what's the best you can do for me? It's amazing when you ask people a question a certain way. Is that the best you can do? Or is that the best you can do for me? People want to do things for you. Yeah. Changing one or two words. I heard one of you guys get on the phone and just naturally he he couldn't help himself. He was like, hey, you talked to someone on my team about selling your property. Give me a call back so I can give you that cash offer. I said, dude, you're screwing yourself. Okay. Because now he's going to call you back and say, so what's my cash offer? Right. Now you have to figure out condition, timeline, motivation, all this information to then make an offer when the way I taught you was the second question you ask him is, is what's his price to figure out if this is even a seller we need to talk to. Right. Now you're asking them to give you their offer. Right. Yeah. And here's the thing. We're the buyer. They're the seller. How was I able to get two and a half contracts a day? Because I talked to more people than everybody else. If you're going to spend 45 minutes talking to a seller that wants too 50, much, 50,000 more than retail, yeah. that's on you because you were building rapport <laughs> and you were doing all these things. You're trying to get you know right off the bat. I'm building rapport when I know that this is the seller I'm going to do business with. Yeah. Let's okay. We're, we're in range. Cool. So tell me. Yes. How now, does that make you feel? Now, you, now you said, we're going to yeah. start building a relationship. Yeah. And again, Like I told you guys, we're not going to build rapport by wanting to understand what their dog's name is or what they're going to do this weekend. We're going to build rapport by being the expert in the conversation and credibility. Yeah. Now they trust us. That's all we want with the rapport. We don't want to go in the friend zone. Yep. We want them to trust us that we are going to take care of their real estate needs. Yeah. And I think it's important to be somewhat authoritative in everything you're doing. Um, And you showed a funny call that you did to the team where somebody was like, you're like, Hey, so yeah, what, what do you want for the house? Right. And they're like, Oh, I don't know. And you're like, well, didn't you submit a, you know, don't you want to sell yeah, the property? Yeah, didn't you submit online that you wanted to sell the property? And they're like, yeah. So what do you want for it? Mm-hmm. And they're like, I don't know. And then you were like, well, when you do know what you want for it, how about you just give me a call back? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Whoa. And what happened? She was like, I want a hundred thousand. Exactly. I was like, I've never seen that one. That one was good. And and listen, the reason yeah. why is because if you go into every single call, with the mindset that you're the buyer. So what I talked about today is, is like, Hey, if you have $500,000 in your bank account, first of all, think about how hard you had to work to get $500,000 in your bank account. Majority of people out there will never have that. Right. Mm -hmm. You have $500,000 in your bank account and you're on the phone with a seller and they say, I want $250,000 for my property. Mm -hmm. How serious are you going to take that conversation before you stroke a check for 250,000? Very serious. Let's say that forget hard money loans, other people's money and all that. Yeah. You're going to take, I say, go into every single call like that scenario right there. Yeah. When you go into every single call like that, I don't care that you're wholesaling it. Yeah. You're trying to figure out where your end buyer will buy this property. If it's a win for them. Yeah. If it's a win for them and it's a win for the seller, it's a win for us. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, that is where the mindset shifts where it's like, dude, I, I don't want to play this game where I'm going to make you an offer and try to guess and see if this is a win for you. Yeah. Cause the next seller will be motivated 
and want to tell me how much they want for their property. And then we can have just a casual conversation about it. Mm -hmm. So so it's just a change in the mindset going into these calls. Yeah. So you're just straight up asking them. And I guess what I was thinking was, okay, so they said, yeah, I I do a hundred. And you say, is that the best you do for me? And they say, yeah, you know what, RJ, I like you. You know, you got that nice beard. I heard you won the Closer Olympics. Like, I, I do 90 for you. Okay. Now, you bring up the Closer Olympics there and the nice beard. I want you to know something. During the 50-day challenge, 125 contracts, 13 of them came from Instagram and TikTok of them watching my reels talking to other sellers. Mm. Is that not crazy? They watched me on TikTok buying someone else's house and then said, huh, I'll sell them my house too. Wow. 13 contracts came from that. And then multiple times I've been live on YouTube and the seller has jumped on the YouTube live while I'm on the phone with them. And they're like, are you on YouTube right now talking to me? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, cause you tell them. Yeah. They're like, they're, they're on the chat watching. They're like, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get a signed contract from it. Yeah. So, so are we going to do this or not? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, this is going to be really embarrassing for me if like you don't sign at this point. Yeah. Like you're, you're watching me <laughs> get embarrassed. So are we going to, yeah. Well, I'm going to need that email right now. <laughs> yeah. Like literally, we're going to have to walk through this right this second. What's your social? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, how does the close go? Cause in my mind, once again, if you just are like, okay, 90, all right, that's fair. Like, let's do it. I think you could do that. I think, um, you know, some people would go the roundabout way. They'd say they wouldn't ever agree. They would just say, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a DocuSign yeah. and, you know, I need your email and we're going to go over this contract real quick. Does that sound good? Like you didn't ever really agree. You're just right. kind of going to the next stage. I think another play is, and maybe at this point it doesn't really matter, but like another play is like, look, you know, I could play games and, you know, try to get you down to 70 or 80 and like play that. But, you know, 90 is fair. Um, and I don't really want to play games. I just, you know, if, if that works for you, that's going to work for me too. So one of two things has to happen there. We're yeah. not, we're off on price a little bit. So we have to offer some sort of range to get them to come down. So say a hundred thousand was the price that the seller set. Yeah. And we need to be at 90. Yeah. You know, I'm going to hit them with, you know, I appreciate you being candid about where you need to be. I need to be somewhere closer to 90. Yeah. Is that possible? And then educate them on why I need to be at 90, mm -hmm. which is a huge difference where like, it's very, it's a very candid conversation where I'm actually talking about after repair value, holding costs, closing yep, costs, yep. repairs. Like I, actually, I used to do that too. Like breaking it down. And the funny thing about it is, is like we use the, the saying it's math, not magic. And when you say that to a seller, Suddenly it takes the emotion out of it. Yeah. Where it's like, it is math. So where are we going to argue about these numbers? Yeah. And, and it's only our profit. That's all they can argue about. Yep. So realistically, it comes down to they're they're flat out going to have to say, I don't want you to make money that much money. I yeah. want you to make ten thousand dollars less. Yeah. And that's really hard for a person to say. So there's that scenario. It's a scenario in which we're okay with the price. We're going to walk them through the next steps of what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. So you're good with 90. All right. Here's what's going to happen next. I'm sending you the agreement. We're going to come out. We're going to do our walkthrough in the next couple of days. We're going to open up escrow. Mm -hmm. If everything checks out the way that we talked about today, then we're good to move forward at this price. If it's not, then we're going to have to have a conversation about what we discovered during a walkthrough. Right. So we're setting ourselves up for, hey, we're buying this site unseen. If we need to renegotiate, this is the reason why. Yeah. It's funny, man, because I haven't done sales training in a long time, but that was one of the things I always did with sellers is like basically my last resort, right? Because if we were close, like you said, right. and they're like, ah, oh, I just can't budge. I'm like, all right. Is it cool if I just be transparent with you about how this deal is going to play out right. and why I would do it? And I'm like, sure. But all right. Your house, when I fix it up, is going to be worth 300 grand, right? And you're telling me, you know, you'll take 240 right now. And that may seem like you're giving me a deal, but let me just explain to you why it's not, <laughs> right? At, two, at 300, I'm going to pay 
you know, 8% and all these fees. Let's just round up to 10 because there'll be some repair requests and all these things, right? Explain it a little more in depth. But I mean, right there, that's 30 grand right off the top. Yep. Okay. I also do need to fix up the home. We've talked about that in order to get that 300 grand. That's not worth that right now. I'm going to need to go put 30 grand into this. So at this point, I'm now at your 240 number. Yep. Not even accounting for other things that I have to do. You know, one thing I always do is I get investors in my deals. And so I have to pay them interest because at the end of the day, I don't just have all the money in the world. You know, I'm going to buy multiple properties this week. I'm not just sitting on $30 million. If I was, I wouldn't be talking to you, quite right. frankly. Yep. And so I'm here to make a deal, but I also have to make my company money. And it costs money to even get you to call us. So, you know, if I go and pay them, now I'm at 220, you know, like that's my break even point when it's all said and done. So when you're asking for 240, it just doesn't make sense. And what's crazy about being that transparent with a seller is, is that when you're done and you sit in silence. Yeah. I'd just be like, so why would I do the deal? Right. Now they are actually thinking on the level in which we want them to be thinking, which is on the numbers, understanding where we are because we were fully transparent. Yep. Where does the argument go? It's either going to go really well for you and they're going to sign the contract mm -hmm. or it's going to go sideways because the emotion and the, the illogical side of that person. Yeah, then there's nothing out. you can really do. And we, sh we just found out that we probably didn't want to be doing business with them anyways. Exactly. And like even the numbers I just gave, like I would, you know, that's not even really that close, but let's just say 240 was the break even, right? And they're asking, uh, you know, 250, right? So my profit's 10 grand if I was to do this deal right now. And, you know, like for me, I'm always thinking in terms of a flip, like what would a flipper pay? Right. Um, and so it's just like, hey, let me ask you a question, right? We just went through the numbers. You agree. Would you do all the work required and take all the risk we are talking about in this market with these interest rates, with this much uncertainty, with this old man in the White House who I don't know what he's about to do? Okay. Would you do that for 10 grand? Like that's the upside? And they'll yeah. be like, no. I'd be like, why are you asking me to do that? Right. You know? I mean, but if you if you really want to sell your house, put it on the MLS. Like you don't need me. I, then, I will <laughs> say in that that num that line right there is we put sellers in one of three buckets. Mm -hmm. It's do you want to sell? What's your asking price? What's going on? From there, we should know price and motivation. Mm -hmm. If there's no price and no motivation, that bucket, we instantly refer them to a realtor and we're off the phone. Yeah. I probably said that line right there, like, why haven't you listed with a realtor? Mm -hmm. This is what realtors exist for. Yeah. You. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Like, I need to move on to the next seller. If the price is wrong, but there's motivation, those are the more common calls for us. Mm -hmm. It's about diving in to understand where they got that price. And then explaining and educating that their motivation has to match with price. Exactly. And then the ideal scenario is price and motivations, right? And that's just lay down. Exactly. You know? Yeah, those are lay downs. Right. But like what we're talking about is they're obviously motivated and we're close. And now I'm just explaining to them like, look, this makes no sense for me. You already agree. You wouldn't buy this if you were me either. So right. your only option is to list for to do what you want to do. Yep. And you know, so I, and, and then this is having the, the guts to just walk away, right? Where you're just like, you, we can list it for you. Like, I, I don't mind doing that. I'll make 10 grand listing it for you. Exactly. I would rather list it for you <laughs> than risk everything to make 10. Exactly. Let's just do that. And then they're like, oh, well, you know. And this is, this is the thing is like, I tell everybody, you cannot have a fear of walking away from a deal. And the fear of like, I lost out. No, you didn't. It's like, no, we were talking today about a deal that when we ran the numbers, it was like your boy, Mike, he felt like he missed out on an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we actually ran the numbers, it was like, no, this was a blessing from God that you didn't get this deal right here. Yeah. And it's all about that market understanding. And then really breaking down the numbers on from the as is comps perspective. And it's like, hey, we don't manufacture deals, we find deals. Yeah. 
And if you're sitting there and you're trying to manufacture that deal, then it's probably going to be a mistake. This is great that someone else came along <laughs> and manufactured it. Yeah, yeah. Like, good job. Let's move on to the next one. Exactly. And I think that's what, even like with our students, um, I try to like relay this home to them. I'm like, hey, look, if you're cold calling, okay, because this is very, you know, earlier you said, hey, I know that with 50 leads, I'm going to close seven out of 50. Yep. Well, lead quality is always very different, right? Yes. Hey, if we get a bunch of TV leads and PPC leads, yeah, we better be closing at least one out of 10, yep. bare minimum, you know, in this Vegas market. Now, if we do it in the Midwest, like we better be at a higher clip. Yes. Now, if you're cold calling sellers, that's a totally different ball game than a seller who literally says, hey, I'm filling out because I want to sell right now. Right. You're talking about on those yeah. cold call leads. Some of the nation's top cold calling units out there are closing at like one out of every 21 leads. Mm -hmm. And that's leads. Real leads. How many dials did they have to make to yeah. get the 21 leads? I mean, you're talking about thousands of dials. Yeah. And I tell the students, I go, look, expect one out of 50 to work out. And that's what Robert even said too, like their data shows. And I said, look, the whole purpose of this is like, is cold calling the best thing ever to do long term? No. Is it a good way to start and build your skill set and like get out of your comfort zone and start talking to people? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we want you to. And is it cheap? Is it not going to burn you? Because if you go start paying a hundred bucks for a lead, yeah, you could get burned really quick, you know, as a newbie. Oh, for sure. And what we're also talking about with the deal analysis, the understanding, hey, is this actually a deal? Is it not a deal? Yeah. Like you can also lose all of the momentum that you have. By doing bad deals. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, that, I've done that, bad deals. That can, that can kill you. <laughs> yeah. Even as a wholesaler. I mean, sometimes when we talk about bad deals, we think about it from a flipping or landlord perspective. Yeah. But trying to dispo a deal. I mean, I can't tell you how many students we've had that have tried to dispo deals for two, three, four weeks. Yeah. And lost all of their momentum on their deal flow on acquisition. Opportunity cost. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. They're just trying to move this piece of crap. So, yes, the, the value and cold calling getting used to being comfortable on the phone and asking the right questions. I mean, but the other part about it is, is if you're going to cold call though, don't just go into it, just trying to burn and turn and where it's like, Hey, do you want to sell? Yeah. What's the condition like? Good. Okay, cool. And then push it off to a closer. Right. Like actually try to build some skills along yeah, the and way. Rapport and everything. Right. Yeah. So with that being said too, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about, just different markets because yeah. that was also one of the reasons I reached out to you. I was like, Hey, in my mind, I'm in a tier one market. I understand the pros and cons. The pro is finding, buy, finding buyers is easy. Um, the, the fees are, are way bigger, but the con is it's harder to get deals. You know, it's very competitive. Yeah. And then you said, Hey, well, you know, there's also the tier two markets and you know, they're going to have smaller fees. The acquisitions are going to be much easier, but yeah, you're going to have to work hard on Dispo to sell them. Yeah. The thing about it is, is those tier two markets that we're talking about, the dispositions isn't as difficult as like, there's a, there's a lower tier. There's tier three, which yeah. we don't want to be in. Yeah. I mean, those are going to be the ones where you're really going to have to work. When I talk about like a tier two market, I mean, we're talking about like a Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Yeah. Okay. We got apartment there. And and the thing about that is, is you can easily find buyers in Cedar Rapids, Iowa inside of Investor Lift. So it's not like you're working dispositions, but the acquisitions is so much easier there in comparison to Vegas. Oh, right? for sure. But you're not going to get a 40K rip in Cedar Rapids. Right. Well, you can. But not very often. Everybody would look at you like the richest man. And like, <laughs> you wholesaled one for 40? What yeah. the? You must have gotten it for a zero. <laughs> <laughs> you, what kind of magic is that? Right. That's not math. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, I, I've always, you know, said, hey, anything west of Texas, obviously I'm from Texas. So I said anything west of Texas is going to be one of those more difficult markets yeah, yeah. on acquisitions, higher assignment fees. Just north of Texas? It's all, it's all looking good. Yes. East. I mean, listen, Midwest, some about that's like the go-to markets for any virtual wholesaler that's looking to do volume. Yeah. You know, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, all those places. Yeah. Great for volume, lower assignment fees, somewhere in the 10 to 12,000 average assignment range. Yeah. yeah. But 
you're, you know, you, and you, by the way, you brought up a good point for me that made me say, all right, you know what? We're going to push the students to tier two. You were, it was momentum and you've mentioned it a few times. Yeah. And, you know, for us, it's like, yo, we, we like fat deals, man. Like I'm, I'm all about just, uh, that's just what I'm about. Right. Um, but you were like, Hey, it's, it's good to get momentum, especially for students. Cause if they start seeing, you know, themselves have one deal, whether it's five grand or not, it's like, yo, that's a deal. Like mm -hmm. I'm motivated now. Dude, I, I had a student that just posted a check for $3,800. They're hyped. The reason why he was hyped is because that got him over six figures this year. Mm. And that was such a monumental moment for him. Right. He did the deal in Oklahoma. Yeah. Whereas he, he lives in Utah. Yeah. The thing about that is, is that was such a monumental, like six figures. Yeah. Whereas you're talking about, that's like three deals here in Vegas. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But for other people, they look at a place like Utah and Vegas, they cannot compete with your marketing spend here. Right. So when we're talking about, Hey, I'm a student and I'm getting started and I need, I need to do a deal. Right. Like, Go do a deal in Little Rock, Arkansas, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, or a place like that where you can get that momentum of cashing a check. It, the dollars don't really matter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just the, it's like the ability to go to your spouse and say, hey, remember that crazy thing called wholesaling? Mm -hmm. Like, I actually got a check. I'll never forget that first check I got in 2014 was $7,500. Mm. And it was like, dude, this happened. Like I thought it was like a scam the whole way until the 7,500 <laughs> went in the bank account. I just, I was like, this is going to not work. I literally called the, the escrow officer every single day. and was like, just so you know, I'm coming to a close and I don't have $92,000. I'm not buying it. Like, this guy's supposed to send you the money. You, you say this double close could just pass through magically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, I have no $92,000. She's like, RJ, it's it's okay. I do this all day. Yeah. So the having that feeling, I remember that still. Yeah, it's yeah. nine years ago. But at this point, you know, with our students, it's about deal flow, getting that trust factor. Mm -hmm. And then they get the confidence to say like, hey, let's go do some marketing in Vegas and yeah. Salt Lake City and Seattle and let's yeah, see and, if we can get a deal. And that's the point of this whole program is like, for me anyways, like I'm going all in on this model and like, I know it's going to scale and crush, um, as a win-win, right? The students, us, everyone. Um, but it is for sure the just stepping stone. I tell them all, I'm like, guys, I don't want you to just do deals with me forever. Like right. let's, let's, okay, cool. You got your feet wet. You got some wins. Okay. Let's go out on your own, you know, maybe start getting some better leads, you know, right. paper lead or, you know, PPC or these other things. And then we'll go that route. And that way, you know, if you can cut your teeth cold calling, this is going to feel like the easiest thing ever when you go to this. Exactly. And the the thing with cold calling and then having you guys lock up the deal. Yeah. Is they get this backseat like way to watch the transaction go down on the how did y'all analyze the deal? Yeah. Why did you lock it up at that price? What were we able to sell it for? Right, exactly. Right. Whereas a lot of times you don't get that kind of handhold experience. No. You know, it's kind of like, all right, so I got a deal under contract. My options are I either try to dispo it on Facebook, mm -hmm. Craigslist, or JV with someone, and then they just dispo it and I have no idea how it played out or what happened. Right. Yeah. It's just, oh, okay. I went JV with a big box wholesaler, and then the next thing you know, they said it was sold and I'm getting 10K. Yeah. I don't know how that's not really like educating you along. No, the way. you made money. Right. But yeah, my motto with this is like learn while you earn. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious, like at this point in your career, right? You're still closing because you just love doing it. And it's what the company needed, like you said. Um, it needed this momentum and the spark. And um now things are going well. You guys are dialed in with this model. Mm -hmm. Um like, what's the future hold? Like, do you plan to try and scale it? Do you see yourself moving out and getting on the business side or the, uh, not the business, but the owner side? Yeah. Like, what's the plan? So I'm really big on having a younger team right now. 
Um, we've got three 21 year olds okay. working with us. Okay. Uh, 25 year old, um, and, and another 20 something year old. And, and our team's very young and very dedicated. And some of them have already been with us for three years mm -hmm. or not. And I'm seeing them kind of, it's better than pizza hut. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I'm seeing them kind of follow in mine and Cassie's shoes, but at a much younger age to kind of eventually replace us where we are as yeah. we grow. Yeah. Um, we're just not at the point right now where I, I don't want to stop playing the game. 